family. Amen? Three people of a family. That's awesome. This is good. So this is my family right here, here in the gallery. Um, just love you guys so much. And I, I just believe in covering one another. And Grace, who led us in worship today, she's familiar to most of the people in here. Um, she was gone for a season last year to YWAM. And, man, God just rocked her world. And it changed her forever. I knew that he would. And showed her the next step. And I just want her to tell you, I, I've told her, I want you to do this at 3 o'clock. And just share your heart. And I want you to just be open to what she's saying. And then we'll get into the word. But I just want you to know what's going on. And I believe if somebody goes, then we support however we possibly can. So come on up, Grace. Share what's on your heart. Hello, everyone. Although I've already said hello. <laughs> um, like Reggie said, I was gone for extra six months. Um, last September through mid-March, I was um, in YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission. Their, um, their you know, mission statement, their whole goal in doing YWAM is to raise up missionaries, equip them with the biblical foundations and the Holy Spirit, and then send them out into the nations to complete the Great Commission. So that's what I was doing. I was in Kona, Hawaii for three months, and then I went up with my team of 12 to Nepal to do missions work. Um, that Each day kind of looks a little different. Uh, we would, every morning, get up. We would have devotions and worship and just asking God, like, what do you have for us today? Like, what do you want us to do? Laying down all of our agendas. Um, sometimes that was just going, you know, there's streets with shops and going and just sitting with them and drinking tea and just sharing, like, you know, just getting to know them and them getting to know us and building that relationship. Other t days it was, he would give one of us a picture of a tree and a lady in red standing under it. And her knee would be in pain and you need to pray for her. And so we would be like, okay, like I guess we're going to go out and see where he takes us. And then we would be walking and then we would just see this tree and a lady in red standing under. So we would go up and be like, you know, they speak in Pali, but sometimes they can speak a little English or we would be able to talk a little back and forth. But we would be able to, you know communicate like does your knee hurt and they're like yes and you're like can i pray for you i believe in you know jesus and that would open the door into sharing the gospel with them and they get a tangible way of feeling jesus love for them so that's kind of what that season looked like um i'm glad to have been home for this time and to be able to be with family and to be here um but now he's calling me to go back to kona hawaii for nine months it's a missional training program so I'll be going into deeper biblical studies. I'll be able to do more um, music and writing and helping with um, the campus worship there. And so basically just, you know, taking the gifts and the passions that God has given me and just developing them more so I can further do missions with, you know, for Jesus and whether that's with YWAM or back home or wherever he calls me to afterwards. So you guys have a pamphlet kind of thing. Um, there's some in the back. They were in the bulletins. We don't do bulletins at the three. So if you guys want to look over that, that just kind of tells you what I am doing. Um, I guess Joy has some if you guys want one. Um, that just tells you what I will be doing. Um, gives you some information if you feel led to um, support financially. Um, there is cost to going back. Um, thankfully, it's not outrageous or anything. But I know that God will provide, and you guys are his vessels, so I encourage you, just ask him, am I supposed to invest in grace right now in this season? And if it's a yes, then just ask how much, big or little, not a, whatever, just be obedient, because he blesses obedience, and I want him to bless you as you bless me and furthering, you know, his kingdom. But um, if you guys would like to fill it out, you can just place it, there's like little boxes out there, or give it to Joy at any time. Um, even if you guys aren't going to do anything, um, at the bottom there's, I'll have like a Facebook group to keep everyone updated on what I'm doing and what God's doing in the nations too. Because we'll have a lot of people come back through. So thank you guys. I love you all. And I'm so thankful that you guys are my family. So God bless.
Thank you, Grace. I asked her to do that. Uh, Joy has those things. Uh, she's going to be here for, what, another month or so? Uh, we're going to pray over her before we send her out. But I, I believe in giving. You know, I believe in supporting as, as she steps out and obeys. There was a word spoken over this church a long time ago, and I believe it, that this is an Antioch church, that we're going to be a church that sends a lot of people. And to me, I think that that is a true key of success in church. You know, when you realize it's not just about you, but you're helping build the kingdom and the fact that somebody's willing to go, we ought to support her however we can. And so I ask you to prayerfully consider. Uh, if, and this morning, actually, somebody gave a, a strong exhortation and just threw some money down on the altar. And it took almost like $2,000 up for her to, to help get her there. And I, I'm believing for, you know, for her whole needs to just be met because I know that God provides. If God leads you to do so, give. If God wants you to give um, monthly, then do that too. Just seek his face, and I know that he'll lead all of us. Speaking of giving, we do believe in giving here at the gathering, and there's offering boxes out front. We don't take time in the service to do that, or you can give online or text GIVE to 270-906-9658. And just that's between you and the Lord. Just obey the Lord, and I know that he will bless us. Guys, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. You know, Christianity is not easy. Uh, I mean, it's not hard. I guess there's aspects that it doesn't seem easy, but it, it's not hard. You know, and I, I know this book oftentimes can be confusing. You know, we get in here and it's like, oh, what in the world does that mean? And I, I don't know. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in here that seems difficult. But actually following Christ is some of the easiest stuff that you'll ever do. And I was reading this passage, and God just illuminated five truths to me from Acts 1-6 through Acts uh, 1-11. And what is that, five or six verses there? And five truths. If we can do these five things, it's really a back-to-the-basics kind of message of what he's called us to be and called us to do. But before we get here, I just want to kind of draw the scene of what's happened Christ, obviously, has fulfilled his purpose on earth. And, you know, I, I've thought if I could ever live at a season of, uh, at like a time, it, it would be during this time. To actually see with your eyes these things, this had to be absolutely fascinating. I mean, we're not talking about these people live by faith like we do, believing that this happened. They saw Christ take nails in his hands and take his last breath and die with their eyes. I mean, that they saw miracles upon miracles. They saw the man die on a cross. They encountered him resurrected a few days later. I mean, that had to be just one of the most awe-inspiring moments. It was the most awe-inspiring moment of history, but they saw him. I mean, after he resurrected, uh, they're in this room, this locked room, actually together, uh, afraid and praying. And they didn't know what was next, what was going to happen. And Jesus just shows up amongst them. They saw this, and he hung out with them for like 40 days. Can you imagine this? I mean, think about this. A man that they saw die, that they were following, that's now resurrected, and they're encountering him. And in this last passage... I mean, if you could ask him something, what would you ask him? If you could like talk to him, what would you talk to him about? If you had that moment to like actually converse with the resurrected Messiah, what would that moment look like? Well, Jesus is about to ascend. And these few verses right here, I just want to read it, and then we're going to kind of comb back over through it. But it says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I mean, every charismatic in the world knows this verse. You can quote it. And you've got like tattoos of it on your back. Everybody knows this verse. You will have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. Now, we don't know that as much, but we do know the first part of that. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. I mean, just stop. Think about this. 
They were watching a man like levitate into the sky, being carried by the clouds to the right hand of the Father. They saw this happen. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. So I've got five truths that I want us to grasp from this passage because I think it's so powerful and it's so basic and it's so elementary to our faith, but it's so vital because these five things really encapsulate who we are, what we're supposed to be, and what we're supposed to be doing. The first one is this. So I asked you, what would your conversation be like with a resurrected Lord? Theirs is not quite what I think mine would be. Because the disciples followed him all along. I mean, they had been following him for, what, three and a half years? Like calling him rabbi. But they came to Jesus with an agenda. They were following him, wanting him to do something for them. Now, first of all, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having requests. I mean, we have prayer requests all the time. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the Bible actually says, let your prayers and supplications be heard. You know, ask these things of God. But that can't be our motivation in following Jesus. Their prayer request was this. And it was a good one. You know, we've got these Roman oppressors that are just ruling over us. We want to be free. We, we want to be rid of these people that are controlling us. Get Rome off of us and restore Israel to what we're called to be. God's people, God's nation. And that was their question as Jesus is about to ascend. I mean, they didn't say, wow, you're the Lord. I mean, you just resurrected. This is amazing. They didn't say, you're the king. You truly are. Their question was, now, can I have what I want? Can, can I get it now? <laughs> can I have what I want now, Jesus? Now that you've, like, died and resurrected, now can I have it? I mean, now. Now's the time, isn't it? Jesus' response is so classic. I mean, it sounds so nice as we read it, but his response actually was just, that's, that's none of your business. I mean, we honestly live in a culture that we think everything is our business. You know, <laughs> mind your own business? I don't think so. That is my business. You know, we're all busy bodies. But Jesus says, as they said, hey, here's my prayer request. That, are you going to restore us now? And Jesus says, that's not for you to know. In other words... That's none of your business. And the first thing that I see getting us back to basics here is this. Following Jesus means that we drop our agendas and we take him as Lord. See, that meant I trust him enough that he's going to work all this stuff out. Uh, Bill Rowley used to say something all the time. He still does. Stop majoring on the minors. Keep the main thing the main thing. But in Christianity, we make it so difficult. And honestly, there's tons of things that we spend our time and efforts on that can be categorized under the fact of that's not for you to know. See, there's plenty in this book that is for us to know. You know, it's for us to obey. It's very clear and concise. But we spend like time arguing on who was Cain's wife. Why does it matter? Who cares? It's, it's kind of irrelevant to my faith. Or this is the big one. When is the rapture taking place? I don't know. I mean, the Bible actually says it's going to happen. Christ is coming back. But even the Son, only the Father knows. But we spend so much time. Is it pre-trib? Is it mid-trib? Is it post-trib? When's this going to happen? I mean, it's an interesting discussion. But honestly, I think a lot of our motivation is that is this. We like to be Christians that live on the line. In other words, I'll do what I want to get as close to this line as possible. I think God didn't tell us for a reason because he knew if we knew when the rapture was taking place and when Christ would come back, we would live however we wanted to till about a week before and then we'd just kind of start going to church and wearing our tie and 
carrying a big family Bible that's just enormous and looks spirit like here I am, God. I, I'm just thankful they didn't tell us, you know, because we're line living Christians, is what we do. We spend time focusing on that, and Jesus says, That's not for you to know. And there's been like tons of date setters with that. I mean, and every one of them have been wrong. And people give me books all the time of stuff like that. I'm like, Do I have to read this? It's not for us to know. I mean, Jesus tells us that's not for you to know. Trust me, it's okay. We have to drop <laughs> our agenda. And here's the truth of the matter. We ought to wake up every single day. And we ought to talk to the Lord before we do anything else and say, God, I don't know when you're coming back. But I believe you will. And I hope it's today. But I'm going to live my best for you right now. And if you did that every single day of your life, and you devoted yourself to obeying that, and getting the heart of Christ every day, these things that we think is what it's all about will just begin to fade. And all of a sudden, we'll begin to get the heart of God. Because the heart of God has not changed. It's always the same. And His heart is this. He is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. See, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. Following Christ means we leave our agendas and our thoughts at the door, and he truly is the Lord. That's difficult when we really, really want things. But we don't follow Christ with the motivation of, if I follow you, you'll give me this. We follow him because he's the resurrected king of kings. <laughs> and he's worthy of our total allegiance. We don't follow him because he's like the Christian vending machine that gives us what we want when we pray. We follow him because he's the resurrected Lord of lords and he's worthy of it. That's the first point. I want to get you with your faith. Get over your agenda and get the heart of God. And those things that you think are just so important, we've got to get past them and realize some things are not for us to know. But Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. In other words, it's none of your business that the Father has fixed. But, in other words, but this is what it's about. Get past your agenda, but this is what it's about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Let me tell you, I'm so thankful that he said that. And of course, Jesus is instructing them they need to wait in Jerusalem. And we know in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And in charismatic culture and churches, I, mean, I don't like labels, but they use phrases like, God is going to come. The Holy Spirit is going to move. He's going to Let me tell you, we're not waiting for God to do anything. We're not waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. He already came. He's here. Yeah. There, there's no waiting on this side of Pentecost. That happened before. That's just Christian jargon. Like, we're waiting for the Holy Spirit. No, you're not. He's waiting on you, actually. He's here. He's manifested himself. And he says, you're going to receive power when he comes upon you. Now, let me ask you this. Power... For what? Because I've seen so many different things in my life that I need the power of the Holy Spirit for. <laughs> and a lot of times people use the term revival for that right there, you know? Like a sustained season of manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what God wants. He wants obedience. That's what God wants. And He will give us the Holy Spirit to just move in our midst. Power. But why do we need the power of the Holy Spirit, the empower of the Holy Spirit? First thing that I've seen is this. We need power to live. I can't live in my flesh. <laughs> I can't overcome temptation in Richie's flesh. Has anybody ever struggle with temptation? Or am I the only one that's kind of not fully sanctified yet? And when the enemy comes at me, and the, man, it's 
every single time when I'm like, oh, I can do this. I got this. No, I don't. I just end up falling on my face over and over and over. And then I come groveling back to God with the, I'm so sorry, Lord. I missed it. I messed up. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I can't do this. And God's like, finally, that's all I needed you to say. You can't do this without me. You need my strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to even live. <laughs> we need the power of the Holy Spirit to... Man, you ever have those times when you're just in this season of darkness or something's coming against you and all of a sudden just a verse pops out of your mouth and you start praying that? And I'm like, God, where did that come from? That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he's going to bring to remembrance all the things that I taught you. We need the Holy Spirit for power to live. But we also need it for this. Power to witness. Let me tell you, trying to talk to somebody about Christ without the Holy Spirit moving, you are wasting your breath. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the most great soul winner in the whole world, but I can tell you this. When I try to just get into a conversation, I do not do good at all. And here's where we are in today's culture. Christianity has been relegated to some sort of psychological argument now. You know, here's why. You can't explain that. You can't explain Christianity. It's not something to be understood. It's something to be lived and experienced. And the Holy Spirit, it says, he's constantly drawing men unto God and pointing them to Jesus. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to witness. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be the soul winners that he's called us to be. Because without that, we are weak. We need the power of the Holy Spirit for demonstrations of the Spirit to point to Jesus. In the next couple of chapters over, this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I reference it a lot. In Acts chapter 3, there's Peter going to church. And... There's like a lame beggar on the side of the road and he's asking him for money and Peter just looks at him and says, I'm broke, I don't have anything. And he just points at him and he says, but silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. Rise and walk! Is that what he did? What is that? That is a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. To be able to point this man to Christ. And that little miracle, not a huge miracle right there, turned that region upside down. Because it was something to point to Christ. Now let me tell you something. You do something like that without a demonstration of a spirit's power, you can't. I can't make anybody walk. I can't make the lame leap, <laughs> the blind see, but God can. We need the power of the Holy Spirit for its demonstration. Man, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to pray. The Bible says there's times that you don't know how you ought to pray. My goodness, that would be the tagline on my autobiography, the Richie Clendenin story. He doesn't know how to pray. <laughs> Man, I remember going to prayer meetings, hour-long prayer meetings, and I would sit there, and I'm like praying for every person that I know, their third cousin, three times removed, and their second grade teachers. And I look at the watch. It's been like five minutes. Like, what? Is this anybody else's prayer life? I mean, or is it just me? I'm like, what in the world? God, I, I've been focusing all the time on posture. Is it 45 degrees? Is it 90 degrees? What? How am I supposed to do this? But when I learn how to pray in the Spirit, man... Oh my gosh, it just revolutionized my life. And the Bible just began to live through me. It's like, because there's so much that I don't know how I ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes through you. We need power to be built up. Jude says this, pray in the Holy Spirit. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. And there's times that we look to others to do that in us. We can't live on other people building us up because that will rarely be there. But you have the power to build yourself up through the power of the Holy Spirit. First thing in our faith is <laughs> we need to get past our agenda. Second thing, we need, it. Man, we need the Spirit's power in our life to live a truly Spirit-filled life. The third thing is this. Now, this is one of my favorite parts of this passage. Once the power of the Holy Spirit is upon you, he says... 
you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the uttermost parts of the world. You will be my witnesses. And how long ago was this uttered? 2,000 some odd years ago? Why is that job not done yet? But there was a strategy meeting in the sanctuary on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this past week of learning how to reach the unreached people groups that remain. Why 2,000 years after Jesus said we're going to witness about him everywhere on the earth, are there unreached people groups? While there's literally billions of Christians on the face of the planet, how can those two coexist? How can billions of Christians with this right here, you'll be my witnesses to the uttermost parts of the world, and unreached people groups who's never heard the name of Jesus coexist? For 2,000 years. One thing that I have seen in my life, and I love it, is the Holy Spirit, man. When you experience Him, you can't shut up about it. When we have truly encountered God, it changes us. And the proof is this. The next chapter over, we know that they're together in one accord, praying in the upper room. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit just fell in that place. And it says divided tongues of fire rested on them all. And it goes on to say that there were devout men from every nation under heaven who heard them exclaiming the praises of God in their own native tongue. Now that's beautiful. That's an awesome thing. I mean right there, if the story ended right there, it's like wow. But it continues. And it continues in such a profound way. It says Peter steps up and addresses them. And he says, men and women, these men are not drunk. And then he goes into one of the greatest servants. It's awesome. And 3,000 people, the first 3,000 people perhaps, are added to the church. Evangelism, witnessing. But what sticks out to me about this is the last time we saw Peter, he was dropping out of disciple school. He was a failure he couldn't cut it. He was a reject. <laughs> After Jesus had resurrected, like we saw, and he steps into that room. Peter makes this bold confession and says, guys, I'm done. I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the family business fishing. I can't cut it. And Jesus pursues him where he's at. And he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? It's like, Jesus, I mean, come on. It's not a matter of love. You know I love you. I followed you for three years. You're one of my best friends, but I have failed you miserably. Jesus, you don't want me. I quit. I mean, thanks, but I quit. I'm just not good at this. I'm a better fisherman than I am disciple. I mean, because you remember, he denied knowing Jesus multiple times. This is the last time we saw Peter. Jesus goes through this whole exchange like three times. And do you know me? Do you love me? You know, feed my sheep, feed my lambs and all this. This was the last time we saw him dropping out, quitting because he was a failure, a reject. He couldn't cut it. He wasn't like everyone else. And he knew it and he quit. Jesus calls him back. But here we are after this one encounter in this upper room. And now the very one who was the dropout is stepping up and saying, Hey, men and women, listen, these men aren't drunk. But let me tell you, and he goes into the sermon and 3,000 people are added to the church. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me hope because if God can use a dropout of disciple school, a failure, somebody that 
denied even knowing him, then maybe perhaps he could use each and every one of us too. See, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. See, God doesn't need your gifts. He doesn't need your boldness. Or, or it kind of does, but he, he doesn't need your talents. He needs an obedient voice that says, I realize this isn't about me, but I understand that I can do so much when your spirit's empowering me. Be witnesses. Guys, it's time for us to fulfill this great commission. And it starts with our neighbor. <laughs> it starts here. The church isn't growing at large because we haven't taken it seriously. When there's unreached, David was saying this week, what, 26 unreached people groups? In North America? Are you kidding me? That's crazy. Why? Because we haven't taken this core element of our faith seriously. And, man, God's like ripping some things out of me. And get me to the place of, Lord, I really want to fulfill your word. How many people do we honestly witness about Christ to on a daily basis? I guarantee it needs to be more than we do talking about the basics of the faith through this passage. And I, I'm getting close to being done. We have to get past our agenda. We have to seek the power of the Holy Spirit because we can't do it in our own strength. We have to be the witnesses that he's called us to be. So Jesus finishes, and after he says this, he's lifted up into the sky. <coughs> and it's so cool. And then they were this. It's kind of looking Kind of like we all did at the total eclipse. You know, when we reached totality. I haven't said that word since then. <laughs> we all had on these weird looking sunglasses and we're just like staring. It's like, then after it's over, it's like, okay, I'm just still kind of looking. And that Jesus had like ascended and he's gone. And these guys are just like, he's told them what to do. Hey, go. Go, guys, go. Go into all the world. Go, go to Jerusalem. Get power of the Holy Spirit. And then God's like, maybe they didn't get it. And he sent two more people in white robes and says, hey, what are you doing? Did you not just hear what Jesus said as he floated up in the sky? Why are you just standing around doing nothing? A fourth point is this. We've got to take control of our time and stop wasting it. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 says this. Paul says to the Ephesian church, Awake, awake, O sleeper, and let the light of Christ shine. And then he goes on to say, Because the days are evil, we have to make the best use of our time. Now, this hurts a lot more than the others are like, they're, they're spiritual concepts, you know, and th this is one that brings it back to a practicality in our lives. Guys, we waste time. I waste time. That's one thing God's been doing in my life here lately. Areas that I think, I mean, let's just be honest. I can sit and binge watch The Office for eight hours straight when I get home and just veg out. Oh, oh. Just sit and not think. And hours can pass. I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, you know. But we waste so much time when there's so little time left. Jesus actually says that. It's like the days are evil. Make the best use of the time, Ephesians, because it's slipping from you. Awake, awake, oh sleeper. Why are you standing around here? Why are you just standing wasting time? God, stop and go to Jerusalem. You've got to go there because the time is short. You're wasting time. He just left. He said, do this. Now do it. Man, I've been in this season of like looking what the Bible says and like my life beside it. And they are so vastly different. And I really want my life to reflect what God's word says I need to do. Thank God for grace. Amen? And mercy. And he, he just like puts up with us and helps us get it right. But there's some decisions we've got to make. Like God, 
I gotta make some time management issues because I realize time is slipping away and I can waste everything. Just, just standing around, looking around. You know, we gotta make the best use of the time. Stop standing around. And the last point is this. And honestly, if this one wasn't in here, then the rest of this would be irrelevant. I said, why are you just standing around? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Mm. Here's the truth. And you don't hear, I mean, I, I'm a preacher of this church. I don't preach on this very often. I should more than I do. You don't hear it very often. But it hasn't taken away from the fact that it's true. Jesus is coming back. Man, th this isn't just a life that we're living. I'm telling you, the return of Christ is imminent. When that's happening, I have absolutely no clue. But I know it's still true. <laughs> and I know that he's coming because the Bible says that he's coming. Just like the clouds were open and he was carried into the sky, so he shall return. And this mission is still in our hands that he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and have this loving relationship with the Father. And the time is short, the days are evil, and I'm wasting time. Thank God there's no condemnation, you know. But what a terrible thought to think that people are going to miss out on that. Spend an eternity apart from Christ, specifically because I wasted some time. And that's a terrifying thought, isn't it? It's a heavy thought, <laughs> but it's a true one. I want you to think about this. God has certain people placed in your life strategically for the kingdom of God. You know, your relationships are not an accident. Not one of them. He has placed certain people in our life so that we can introduce them to love. <laughs> because the world needs it. They're crying out for it. And sometimes I pray for people that I know that I'm the answer that I'm praying for. God, save this person. Lord, they need to know you. Lord, just save them. Lord, save them. Lord, save them. Send somebody. Lord, I've sent you. Be faithful. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. It's happening. There's the return of Christ. And he's coming back. There is so much more than this life. The days are quick. James says that life is a vapor. It's here for a moment, and it's gone. The older I get, the more that becomes so stinking true. Today, he's back there helping my wife. My son turned 14 years old. Where in the world did that come from? And this morning, I made this long post, and I posted like 30 pictures. And as I'm going through these pictures, the tears are just dripping off my face. Oh my God. From baby, there he is here. I remember that. I remember that. Oh my, wow. Where did the time go? And I hear Brother Chuck, it doesn't get any better. It just starts like spinning even faster. It's moving away from us right now while we're talking. And the return of Christ is imminent. been so guilty for just standing around. After Jesus said, oh. One of the first sermons I ever preached, and I stuck this in my mind, and I never forgot it. Christianity is simple. Go to heaven. And take as many people with you as you possibly can. It's simple. 
because everybody needs to know love. Father, in the name of Jesus, as I come before you today, Lord, I, I thank you. Lord, this passage is really so, yeah, it's powerful. And it's empowering, Lord, to know that we are your hands and we are your feet. While your heart is beating for the nations, while your heart is beating for lost humanity, Lord, I have been so guilty of just standing and looking around. I've been infatuated with manifestations, Lord, while totally neglecting responsibility and obedience. Well, that is a difficult place to be in. And honestly, if we do that, we're heaping judgment on ourselves. Lord, if we are more infatuated with manifestations than we are devoted to obedience, man, we're, we're in trouble. waiting on the Holy Spirit or waiting on you when you've called us, you've empowered us. Lord, you have empowered us by the power of the Holy Spirit yes. Lord, to witness about you yes. and every person, Lord. And I just ask that, Lord, man, what would it look like if right here at the gathering we took this passage serious? people are here today, 50, 60, I have no idea. But if that many people took it serious and said, I'm going to obey. I'm not going to stand looking around. I'm going to seize each moment because I realize time is short and your return is imminent. Lord, what could we do for you? All right, let's begin right here. I just feel like there's some house cleaning that needs to be done in our lives. I've been wasting. Lord, I've been wasting. I had a different altar call this morning, but I really want to just ask this question this afternoon. Would anybody else join me and say, you know what, Richie? I can relate to that. I know God's called me. I feel his heart. I feel even him pushing me into some things. But honestly, I, just like you, I have wasted a lot of time. And I, I just want to make a devotion and a dedication to myself today that I want to take it serious to press into him. much, but he can use me just like he used them. 